Hi everyone, welcome to the sixth module of our Verilog HDL crash course. In this module, we are going to cover concepts related to Verilog HDL module declaration and its instances. So friends, if you are visiting first time to this channel, you can consider subscribing this channel for more technical videos on VLSI concepts. So now let's get started. So a module is the principal design entity in Verilog. The basic design entity or the principal design entity in Verilog SDL is nothing but a module declaration. Whatever design we are going to model using Verilog HDL, we have to declare a module for that. Or basically we have to build a module for that design. So the first line of a module declaration specifies the name of the module and its port list. So if you see here, we have a design which is nothing but working as a adder and subtractor. So how we can declare this design as a module? So this is the syntax. Here we have to use the module which is nothing but Verilog HDL keyword and then the module name. This is a user defined identifier and then we have to write all the port list which are present in our circuit. And then we have to use input and output keyword for the design ports. So if a port is an input to the design, we have to use the input keyword and if it is an output, we have to use the output keyword. So if we take example of this circuit here in one and in two and add, these are input to the adder subtractor circuit and, and here we have out which is a output signal. So we have to declare input and output all the ports of a design and then at the last and then basically we are going to define the functionality of the circuit using statements. So these statements may have uh, structural statements or procedural statements. And then we have to use the end module keyword at the end of the module. So this is the example here module adder and subtractor and we have the inputs add in one and in two this, which are the input of our uh, this circuit and the out is our output signal. So here is the input and output keyword for all the input and output signals and here we have to uh, write the statements which basically define the functionality of this circuit and then we have to use the end module keyword. So friends now let's see how we can instantiate this module at a top level module. So module declarations are nothing but designs from which one creates actual objects that is nothing but instantiation. So here we saw that we have declared a module. So this declaration of module is nothing but the design of a module. And this design we have to instantiate at a top level where basically it can be treated as a object. So modules are instantiated inside other modules and its instantiation creates a unique object from the actual design. So for example, we have a module and at top level, we have to basically instantiate that module multiple times. So how many times we are instantiating that module, that many objects of that design or that module will be created. And here, one thing is when we have our top level design. So in our top level de design, there may be multiple sub modules, which we are instantiating our, at our top level, very low HDL file. But we do not need to instantiate our top level real log hdl file because that is going to be our top level module file but definitely when we simulate that design we need to instantiate that design in our test batch right now let's see the next point the instantiated module support must be matched to those defined in the actual module design so what is the meaning of this line is how many ports are there in this module these should match while we instantiate this module in a top level design. So there should not be mismatch with respect to the ports. And very important point, modules should not be instantiated inside procedural blocks which are always an initial block. Now let's see what are the ways to instantiate a module in a top level design. So there are two ways to instantiate a module. First is by name. By name means using a dot that means dot design port name and the name 
to which that port is going to be connected in our top level design. So this is one way using the dot character. Let's see an example. So here we have one example and the uh, module name is by name and it has three ports A, B and C. Now when we are instantiating this module in a top level design, the first the first way of instantiation is using the dot. So this is the module name. This is how we will instantiate. This is the module name. Then this is the instance name. This can be anything. This is any uh, again user defined identifier. So this can be any anything. But the first word should be the module name. Then we have the port list. So here. When we are instantiating a module in our top level design, we know that our A should get connected to X. A which is nothing but the module port, port A, it should get connected to X, B should get connected to Y and C should get connected to Z. So this information as a designer we know. And X, Y and J are nothing but our top level Wires in our top level file in which we are instantiating this by name module. So, if for example, we have this by name module dot v file, and then a other file we have each top dot v. So, in top dot v, we have to instantiate this by name module. So, in top dot v, we have three signal x, y, and z. And as a designer, we know that we have to connect x to the a, the first port of the by name module, y, we should connected to the second and G we should connect to the third port in our binary design. So how we can connect them here if we connect using dot then what is the benefit is we, we don't have to worry about the order of the ports in our module. So if you see here the first port is A, second is B and third is C. So if we are using dot then we don't have to consider the order in which the ports are declared in our design. So here we can say that C is basically connecting to Z, A is connecting to X and B is connecting to Y. So this is the first way of connecting the ports while instantiating a module in a top level design. Now let's see the second way. So the second way is nothing but by position. So Placing the ports in exactly the same position in the port list of both the design and the instance here. Whatever the order is there in the design, in the same order we have to you this in the same order we have to connect the ports in while uh, instantiating that module. So let's see an example. So here we have a module by position module, which again has three ports A, B, and C. So if we know that in our module the A is first, B is second and C is the third port then we can connect X, Y and G. So here basically X will connect to A, Y will connect to B and G will connect to C. Now let's see parameterized mode. So parameterized modules have their another benefits and basically they make it possible to use a module or a particular design for different different configurations. For example, let's see here is an example of a shift operation. So we have a module shift module. So if you see here, this is our shift module. We have an input signal and an output uh, uh, and output signal. And here, so here what we are doing is we are shifting the input signal and assigning that shifted value to the output. So whatever the value of n is, so here if you see the value of n is two. So the input signal will get shifted by two and then it will get assigned to our output signal. So this is a module which basically performs a shift operation. So now here if you see here we have a parameter. Now when I am instantiating this module, I will instantiate the module name then this is nothing but a user defined uh, 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 instance name and here we have input and output. So if I instantiate this module which is nothing but parameterized module like this. The default parameter in this module is having a value of 2. Now if I want to shift the input data by 3, I can instantiate this module like this where this is the module name and using a hash character 
I can pass the parameter value. So this is three and here the uh, instance name and input and output. So now I will get the output which is three bit shifted input signal. And if I want to use a five bit shifter, I can instantiate this same module like this. I can pass the parameter five and this is the instance name and this is input and output. So here output will be nothing but five bit value shifted in input signal. So this is the benefit of using parameterized modules. And this is the syntax here the module name and then we have to use this hash keyword and then the new parameter value. So if you have multiple parameters here we have only one parameter if you have multiple parameters we can pass those values parameter one value then comma parameter two values like this and then here is the instance name and then we have to do the port connection so there are two ways of port connections by name and by position the preferred is by name. So I hope this is clear. Now let's see one another concept of macros. So you saw here that a parameter is nothing but here we can define a constant value by using the parameters. So we can also do similar things using macros. So macros do string substitutions and do many of the jobs similar to parameters. But they are good for global parameters because they do not have to pass through modules. So if you see this is an important point. If you see here while instantiating the module we can pass the parameter value but we cannot pass the macro values. Okay. So if we have some very if we have some constant such that that constant value is used globally that means in multiple files. So in that particular case we can consider using macro. So the syntax of macro syntax of macro is define is basically tick define macro name and the value. So if you see an example here we have a macro which is nothing called m and its value is add. And now this macro basically we can define in one file and that file we can pull in all the modules. So whenever in all the modules whenever there is a tick m this tick m will get replaced by the value which is 8. So this is how we use the macros in our very low file. Hope this is clear. Now let's see little bit about the continuous assignments. So if you remember in our first module of Verilog SDL crash course, we studied that there are basically two types of uh, code in Verilog SDL, which are structural code and procedural code. And the continuous assignment is basically associated with the structural code. So the continuous assignment is used to assign a value onto a wire in a module. So in the procedural module, we can assign a value only to a register data type. And we cannot assign a value to a wire in a procedural block. But by using the continuous assignment, we can have the structural code where we can assign a value to a wire using a assign keyword. So it is a normal assignment outside of a always uh, initial and always block. We will cover this in our module 7. And continuous assignment is done with an explicit assign statement or by assigning a value to a wire during its declaration. So there are two ways of assigning a value to a wire. We will see syntax for both the types. Important point to, point to remember is continuous assignment statements are concurrent and are continuously executed during simulation. The order of assigned statements does not matter. Important point. Any change in any of the right hand side inputs will immediately change a left side output. So basically we can say that assign statements executes as soon as there is a change in the right side of expression. Okay, now let's see the syntax. There are two ways for the continuous assignment which is when we are declaring a wire we can assign the value to the wire and the second way is by using the assign keyword we can assign the value to a wire. Now let's see some examples. So here we have a wire A which we are assigning while declaring that with the value 2 tick B 0 1 and the second way is by using the assign keyword and here the order of assignment doesn't matter so i can use this assign b here as well and assign b after that that will also won't make any difference but the important point to remember here is these statements gets executed as soon as there is a change in the right side of expression that means whenever there is a change in the c or d or x or y so guys, I hope this module is very much clear to you 
If you have any doubts, please write down in the comment section. Also, if you like this video, please do subscribe this channel and press the bell icon so that you would get notified as soon as I upload a new video. Thank you very much.